ordination and why it's important. And before we started, I just wanted to uh, do a few introductions. I know that probably most of you here do know the Venerable Chanda and Ajahn Brahm, but you may not know New Buddha Way, which is who we are. I'm, I'm Lynn and this is Ruth. And we have Jeff here as well today, who is our founder. So just to tell you a little bit about New Buddha Way, it was founded in 2002 by Jeff Hunt, who is with us, and it will be 20 years next year. So hooray for New Buddha Way. New Buddha Way teaches the Dharma and encourages participants to see meditation practice as a whole of life orientation, rather than a standalone activity. And Jeff will say a few words to us at the end of the session today. So that is us. So next, a little introduction, not that he probably needs an introduction, is Ajahn Brahm, who studied with Ajahn Chan in 1975 in Thailand, who then sent Ajahn Brahm to Perth, Australia in 1983. I hope I'm getting this right, Ajahn Brahm. You can tell me in a minute. Close enough. Good enough. <laughs> so Ajahn helped to build and is the abbot of the Forest Monastery Bodhinyana in Western Australia. I hope I pronounced that correct. In 2009, Ajahn Brahm facilitated an ordination bhikkhuni ceremony of four female Buddhists. This caused much controversy in the Thai forest tradition, the outcome being that Ajahn Brahm was removed from belonging to the Thai Ajahn Cha Sangha lineage. Ajahn Brahm is a highly respected teacher and is a spiritual advisor to the Anakapa bhikkhuni project and the author of many Buddhist books. So welcome and thank you for joining thank us you. today. Mm -hmm. My so pleasure. Next, who probably doesn't need much introduction either, is the Venerable Chanda, who came across the Buddha's teaching at the age of 20. In 2014, Venerable Chanda took Bhikkhuni ordination, and in 2015, Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Chanda made plans to try and establish a monastery in the UK to increase equality and ordination opportunities for women. Venerable Chanda founded the Anakampa Bukuni project in 2016 at the request of Ajahn Brahm. Venerable Chanda offers retreats, talks, and discussion groups to help raise enthusiasm and funds for the Anakampa project. So welcome, Venerable Chanda. So lovely to have you with us today as well. And welcome all of our visitors to this event today. It's so lovely to have you all here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask both Venerable Chanda and Ajahn Brahm to tell us a little bit individually about why <coughs> the ordination is important and maybe their own sort of um, way of looking at it, you know, what's important to them about that. After they've spoken to us, we will have question and answers. So later on, if you have a question, you might want to put it in the chat box or you might want to ask it yourself, but we'll come to that later. So. Over to both of you. Is this topic so important? Okay, ladies first. No, no, we agreed that you'd start, Ajahn. Okay. Um, it's very important. Now, first of all, that uh, when I saw the first monk I ever saw in my life, and I, it, was in, it was in King's College in Cambridge, in a Wordsworth room, which was weird. I still remember it very clearly. It struck me very powerfully that that had a great meaning, although I didn't understand what that meaning was. It was later on you know, in my student life, doing some meditation, seeing the benefit of especially the very deep meditations. And you always, want, always had in the back of your mind, there was something about, at this time it was only monks, there was something about you know, ordaining and uh, being following the tradition of a Buddha that was very uh, enticing for me. And also that I went to Thailand because literally in London, there was the Thai monks who smiled the most. They were just seemed to be the happiest of all the monks which I saw, even they beat the Tibetan monks in their happiness. So off I went to Thailand. And there, that even though I was, you know, got a really good degree in theoretical <laughs> physics, and nevertheless, uh, seeing someone like Kanajan Chah, who was far wiser than I'd ever thought possible, and inspired me a lot. And when he inspired myself a lot with you know, such you know, simple teachings, just like I'm just picking up something, how heavy is this pen which I'm holding? You throw it away and say it's only heavy when you hold it. And simple ways of teaching really made a profound impression on me. 
So little by little, you meditated more, you became wiser. And you know, when Ajahn Chah asked me to go to Australia to start a monastery, I obviously followed the teacher. And then being a monk in Thailand, in Australia, you're in a Western country, and there was something which was missing. And that was nuns, bhikkhunis, the female form of monks. And so it was always in your back of the mind that there has to be something done about that. But at the time, I, you know, my studies of uh, the in Pali, the uh, suttas and the Vinaya was just starting. But little by little, you know, you had a good education, a good brain, and you had a rebellious nature in you. You weren't just going to follow just because other people said so. You wanted to see you know, what the Buddha said about bhikkhuni ordination. And you saw there very clearly that there was no obstacle to it at all. As far as the Vinaya, the legal uh, justification for female monastics, it was there very clear. The only problem was the political idea of this. And in a country like Thailand, it was very much you follow your leader. And if the leader you know, said it can't be done, then you didn't think about it. But going into places like the West, there you saw that there was no justification of stopping bhikkhuni ordination. And then what happened is four you know, wonderful nuns, and those four nuns, they came to me. There were only 10 precept nuns, not fully ordained. They came and asked me, so can we become bhikkhunis? And the question, the answer was, why not? And I knew it was going to be controversial. I never expected how controversial it was, because I expected most of the, the leaders, especially in the West, I would have a brain. And they even asked my preceptor, who was the acting head of the monastic Sangha in Thailand. And he said, look, you know, the, the Thai rules do not apply in the West. You know, follow the Vinaya. Another very senior monk said, no, follow the most compassionate or um, compassionate decision. And that was to ordain bhikkhunis. So I did that. We ordained the bhikkhunis. And the point is that there's nothing which is illegal about that. There's nothing which you can say was wrong about that. And even the whole idea of lineages, I still respect my teacher Ajahn Chah a lot. You can never take that respect and trust that you have in your teacher, in Ajahn Chah. The other monks who followed him, they were, I don't mind saying this, misogynistic. They would never admit that, but that's my opinion of them. Uh, they were too protected too protected and not challenged enough. And being a monk over in Australia, I was challenged a lot. The Australian people, they will not sort of take a, 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 a shallow answer for granted. And I hopefully that during the question time here, you'll ask tough questions as well. And don't take sort of shallow answers trying to, to push your very good question off. You won't take them at all, but you keep questioning me until and. Um, Aya Chanda as much as you possibly can. But of course, you had to get the support of all the people, all the Buddhists, you know, who support me over in Western Australia. And it was surprising how well that support was gained from all the traditional Buddhist communities, the Thais, the Sri Lankans were great, and the Malaysian, Chinese, the Singaporeans, the Hong Kongese, all the people who came to our monastery and supported us, they were really behind it. And it was one of those supporters, you know, she's, she was Singaporean of the year a couple of years ago. You know, she said she was a very staunch Theravadan Buddhist, but the one thing about Theravadan Buddhism she did not like at all, where are the bhikkhunis, where are the nuns, where's the equity? That didn't make any sense to her at all, and she had a very powerful point. So part of what I was taught as a student, as a monk, as a leader, if there is something missing, you don't just sit there and complain about it, you do something about it. And whatever is needed, you make happen. And of course, you know, now over in Australia, you have these beautiful monasteries. The Nuds Monastery over in Perth is a separate location, uh, much more beautiful than Bodhinyana Monastery. And uh, it's got about, I think, 18 or 19 nuns there. There's so more nuns going to be ordaining in August. So I can't keep up with how many uh, people want to become bhikkhunis. 
These are Westerners, Australians, people, locals. And it's wonderful that this is actually happening and that once you make it possible, the people jump to it and they love it. The reason why it's a monastic tradition is that was actually set up by the Buddha. It has more renunciation. You have to let go of more of your control over your life. It's much more simple if it's done properly. Little things like not having any personal money or cash, you know, just having just to eat in the morning time and having to do a lot of service, but also a lot of uh, solitude as well. And people understand that, they accept that, and they reward that as well. So I think one of the things which I was very happy with, 12 years now since the Bhikkhuni ordinations, and uh, this last year, or just over a year ago, even the Australian government, they gave me this award, the uh, Order of Australia Award, exactly the similar to the OBE. And that was given, at first I thought, I don't need this. No, you don't have accolades. But they said it was for your work to establish equity in Buddhism. So you don't just have monks and lay men, lay women, you also have bhikkhunis as well. I was very, when I saw what they were giving me this for, I never recognized how important this was in religions and that spiritual part of our life to have that equity. It makes no sense to me, it makes no sense to many intelligent people, why you should discriminate on the grounds of gender or discriminate on any grounds if it's not really necessary. So because of that, it's not just with gender equity, it's also just uh, with LGBTQIAE+. We got a couple of monks who were gay before, we have even a couple of monks, which I really love saying this, who are schizophrenic. But our wise mindfulness and kindness and stillness in their meditation, they're doing a wonderful job of their monastic life to show even with someone who's clinical schizophrenia can still be a very, very good monk. And obviously none as well. But of course, that, you know, I was born in England, raised there, and I still feel a connection to England. And when this one uh, English Buddhist came up to me and said, that after the bhikkhuni ordination, after seeing what's possible and what has been done in a place like Australia, how it's grown amazingly powerfully well, it's such a shame that what they said hit me, and I keep remembering this. I chanted has heard me say this many times before, that Buddhism is dark. For women in UK. That was her words. Buddhism is dark for women in your in UK. And I realized you can't just sit there and just do nothing when there's such a feeling. We got to give rise to this bhikkhuni ordination. And of course it's we have the ordination possible now, but it's not the end of the, the work to be done. It's like in the time of the Buddha when there were thousands of Buddhist monks, thousands of Buddhist nuns, thousands of Buddhist lay people of both genders, interacting beautifully well, meditating, becoming enlightened, the whole lot. Why can't we do that today? And so that's one of the things I can do this, that I have the abilities and the support to do such things. So we're going to make it happen. And Aya Chandra is working her butt off, as they say in Australia, just trying to make this happen. It's a huge amount of work. And it's not just for one, one nun. It's for a whole sangha of nuns, which is over four, five, six, 10, 20, 30, 40. Can you imagine that? That you, know, you wake up in the morning, whatever city you live in, in UK, and in the morning you can see nuns, women just walking on arms around in the morning, mindful, calm, just as a reminder of the spiritual life, the mind of this more to life than not just families and money and getting on in life. It's this beautiful spiritual path which you see in the calm, peaceful and kind demeanor of a good monk or nun. 
to see image of the brown robe. And that should be shared not just by men, but by women as well, by gays, lesbians, transgenders, everybody who wants to. Why not? So in the end, that's the reason why I uh, work hard. I've done enough in my life already, but there's still more to be done. As long as there's energy in my body, then of course we will work towards having this equity. Otherwise, it's just, I would be ashamed of Buddhism. I'd be embarrassed being a Buddhist leader. If I didn't do something to improve Buddhism and bring it to the state it was under the time of the Buddha. It can be done, it is being done, it will be done. I'm not sure how long it takes because you know, in Buddhism we have this big idea of many, 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 many years, rebirth. So a bit will happen, we're just putting the seeds in and who knows. Just sometimes I imagine dream about these beautiful monasteries. We can come just to meditate, just to, for a while on retreat or whatever. The beautiful Buddhist nuns. There's enough Buddhist monks monasteries already in the UK. Of course, have some more, of course, but Buddhist nuns monasteries, fully ordained bhikkhunis. Imagine that. It's a dream. And I don't just dream dreams. I make them real. So anyway, that's what I'm about. I think it will enhance Buddhism you know, in UK and in Europe and in the world. Okay, that's what I say. Now, Ayachanda. Thank you, Ajahn. Very beautifully put. And, and all, as always, your words are just so inspiring and rousing and, you know, painting pictures of, of how things really could be. And um, to complement that to some extent, I want to just um, speak from my own personal perspective, because whilst equity um, is very important from a sort of moral perspective, a humanistic perspective, um, there's also the fact, the sheer fact that 51% of the world are female, right? Yeah. And, and the aspiration for liberation is a universal aspiration. It's something that can take root in any, any person's heart. And so when that is there, there's a very strong calling for oneself. Gender has nothing to do with it. We just need to be able to follow a path of renunciation, a path of ordination. And for me, it was very much a calling. Um, so in the beginning of my monastic life, I went to India to practice. And then I ordained in Burma in 2006. Um, and I basically took whatever ordination platform was available for me which at that time was the um, Tila Shin ordination. You can ordain either on eight or on 10 precepts in Burma and uh, you're understood to be a Buddhist nun. And so as far as the monastery is supported, as far as the teacher is willing to um, train and guide you, you will have enough support to live a monastic life. And so I never felt like it was a partial ordination. I felt that I ordained, I renounced, from my heart and with my whole heart you know so that was my when my holy life began it was in 2004 first time for three months and then 2006 and it was only later when my health started to fail in that climate and with the food and I had to start thinking about um, continuing my monastic life outside of that context that I realized there wasn't really a structure in place. There wasn't really a support network for women, for, for nuns, because we weren't really considered um, fully ordained. We weren't really considered um, a field of merit in the same way that monks are. And I started to realize that most women who are nuns in Burma um, basically survive because they're supported by their family or their friends. You know, people coming to the monasteries prefer to offer to monks because they've been conditioned to believe that will bring more benefit to them as donors and perhaps to the world because they're used to seeing monks as the teachers, as the leaders. So I started to realize that there wasn't this sort of framework, you know, um, for, for women, for nuns that would support me beyond there. And it was a long journey to finding an opportunity for full ordination. But when I did come across Ajahn Brahm's teachings, I was still in Myanmar at the time, practicing um, quite intensively. And 
I was drawn to the de depth of the Dhamma in those teachings. And it was only later that I found out that Ajahn Brahm had also facilitated the ordination of bhikkhunis in Perth. And that gave me a lot of confidence and a feeling of real joy and possibility because when you ordain, as I say, you don't ordain half-heartedly, you ordain with your whole heart. It's a huge renunciation um, with many hurdles along the way sometimes, you know, even just practical hurdles. And so when I heard that this was possible and it was happening in Perth, my heart just leapt. I thought, well, why wouldn't I take that opportunity if it was available to me? And for me, there's no judgment there. It's not as though eight precept nuns or siladhara nuns in Amravati are inferior in any way. But I think that, you know, just as in any field, we need to have options. We need to have opportunities um, and different vehicles to practice with. And of course, the bhikkhuni vehicle is the one um, that the Buddha gave us. In a sense, it's our inheritance. Yeah? And he actually said in the Parinibbana Sutta, he said, you know, I will not pass away <laughs> until the community of lay women, lay men, bhikkhunis and bhikkhus is fully established. And until there are, you know, enlightened people in each of these communities, only then he will pass away. So it was always the Buddha's intention to um, to basically make the opportunity for training according to all the training rules he laid down, which are the best vehicle for liberation, available to everybody. And I think, you know, there's no doubt that he would have had the foresight to ensure that that opportunity would continue into the future. And so in the Vinaya, it actually does give um, two possible ways to ordain bhikkhunis. And the first way is that bhikkhus can ordain bhikkhunis, so monks, fully ordained monks, can um, ordain fully ordained nuns. And that's what happened in the beginning, you know, to, to begin the bhikkhuni sangha. But also there's another rule that says bhikkhunis can ordain bhikkhunis. And that came later because there were bhikkhunis available to do those ordinations. And so the kind of conflict comes because some of the monks who are against bhikkhuni ordination say that that second rule basically invalidates the first one. So now that bhikkhunis can ordain bhikkhunis, bhikkhus can no longer do so. But I think a much more plausible interpretation is that the Buddha left both of those rules in place because he had the foresight to realize that there may be a time when the bhikkhuni order is not present any longer. And he ensured by keeping both those rules there that there would be an opportunity for it to be revived. So it matters because for women's own personal liberation, first of all. But it also matters because I think we need to have, uh, we need to see ourselves represented. Mm -hmm. Not only women need to see themselves represented in the monastic form to make that lifestyle seem possible and something realistic for them, but even for men, I think, and for, you know, people who identify as non-binary or transgender, it's so important to have a diversity of teachers in the monastic form. And as Ajahn Brahm said, we're a kind of embodiment of people who have committed to a life of harmlessness, you know, a life of simplicity and contentment, a life of renunciation. It's inspiring to see people who are contented with little and it can help us all whether we want to ordain or not, it can help us all to um, reevaluate our lives and what we really need for our own happiness. So, and uh, as well as that, even if you don't have aspirations to ordain, it gives people an opportunity to be part of a community and to offer support to the monastic Sangha, to learn from them and to come and live in monasteries and experience some of that monastic lifestyle. And, you know, the Buddha said that generosity is also a very important part of the path. So with the monastic Sangha and the lay community, there's this reciprocal generosity. Uh, you support us with your um, food offerings, your service, your financial donations, and we support you with, um, with life, you know, with offering spiritual teachings, with giving guidance on how to live a virtuous life. And we basically become spiritual friends for each other. And so I think, you know, our aim with um, establishing a monastery in England is to establish a kind of spiritual sanctuary where women can feel um, empowered, validated, 
um, have the opportunities to practice deeply, um, but also so that we can offer each other a sense of spiritual companionship and support. And I think, you know, especially with this COVID pandemic at the moment, many of us have been suffering from isolation. And I know from my own community, the Anukampa community, we've been meeting online every week, two or three times every week. And it's really brought home to many people that in times of crisis, in times of despair, the only real refuge is actually the Dhamma. You know, and just having that sense of community, even though it's online, has been a lifeline. I've received letters from all over the world, you know, to say this has really been a huge benefit. And it's basically what has got people through periods of depression, isolation or despair. And I also think that for um, all members of the community, it's really nice for them to have access to a bhikkhuni. I mean, this is not my own understanding, but this is what I've been told, because somehow I think women do have a capacity. We have a particular quality of being able to connect, empathize. Um, perhaps we're a little bit sometimes more approachable. And of course, it depends on the individual. But um, one person wrote to me and they said, um, it struck me how different your way of teaching is compared to the male ajans. You bring more warmth, emotion and intuition. It's probably about personality, but also about gender. And it just shows how important it is to have diversity among spiritual teachers. And I think this is the point, you know, we need to feel represented. We need to have options, opportunities and uh, different people manifesting and living a spiritual life to the best of their potential. So I think that's all I have to say for now. And uh, I think now we're going to move to some questions. I'll let the hosts take it from there. Thank you, Venerable Chanda and Ajahn Brahm. That was you know, fantastic to hear you speak on the topic. So uh, now we do have an opportunity for people who are here to, to ask questions. Again, I'm going to repeat that uh, if you did, we're recording the session. So if, you don't want, if you're going to ask a question, and you don't want to be recorded and be seen, please do uh, make sure your camera's off. If you want to just ask a question, you can put it into the chat and uh, it will be looked at and, and possibly chosen to be read out. So that's your choice. Um, I, can, I could start out with questions as I've got one. Um, I think we have somebody's uh, audio is on. It's not appearance, no? We're okay, right. So I'll, I'll start off with my question, if that's okay, for you both. It appears that your journeys to this stage have been fairly straightforward. But I wonder if you would share with us some of your own personal obstacles or hindrances that you've faced along the way and how you've overcome them. So over to either of you to answer that, or both of you, possibly. Okay, I agenda. <laughs> Ajahn asked me to start with that because I've probably faced a lot more hindrances and obstacles than he has. <laughs> That's an assumption, but I think I know Ajahn pretty well. <laughs> but obstacles and challenges can always be reframed as growth or learning opportunities. And that is how I've tried to see things along the way. As Ajahn knows, sometimes I struggle. Sometimes I don't see it that way when I meet such an obstacle. You know, I get stuck. But um, for me, the question is always, how do I surmount this obstacle? How do I overcome it and how can I grow? And so I guess, as I talked about my path earlier, the first um, difficulty for me on my path was that I had a very strong aspiration to ordain right from the beginning, right from my first retreat. I actually knew that I would be a bhikkhuni or I would be a nun. I think in those days I just said I want to renounce you know I didn't really have the concept of bhikkhuni, non, different type of monastic forms it was just a feeling of wanting to dedicate my whole life to the path and not to have any other responsibilities that could um, not get in the way so much but just um, that would take my energy into a different direction because of course lay people can also progress but it was a very strong calling and it took me 10 years to find an opportunity to ordain. 
during those 10 years, I was not just sitting around hoping to hear about something. I was dedicating myself to practicing and sitting and serving on over 60 retreats, you know, 10 day retreats, 30 day, 45 day retreats and studying Pali and living a very simple life in Asia and always asking all my teachers, my meditation teachers, have you heard of anywhere that I could ordain? What do you think about ordaining? Would it be a quicker path? I've got this such a strong aspiration. And so it took 10 years to actually find an opportunity to ordain in Burma. And when I heard about that opportunity, I was in India on a bus with a friend and I was just quite what's the word when you just almost like just jumping for joy irrepressible I was so excited and I went out even though I hadn't finished my degree I was studying Indian medicine in London at the time because uh, basically I hadn't found anywhere to ordain yet and uh, I couldn't even wait to finish my degree so I went out in the summer and um, ordained for the first time for three months and I knew this is going to be my life you know I'm going to go back and, and continue to you know ordain again and then continue for the rest of my life but of course I think one of the biggest difficulties and why it's so important to establish monasteries in the west is that we're not necessarily suited to that climate and lifestyle longer term and um, and that really took its toll on my health and at that point it was very clear that there were no real suitable options beyond that particular monastery with that teacher so I stayed some time in Amaravati and Chithurst monasteries. They were very accommodating to me, but my ordination wasn't particularly recognized there either. So I was always walking behind the Anagarikas, even though I was a nun and the Anagarikas are still essentially lay people. And, uh, and yes, I'd heard about Ajahn Brahm and wanted to get to Perth, but again, even though his monastery and the Bhikkhuni monastery there is so successful, it's one of the only ones in the world. And so there wasn't a place for me so basically, I had to survive for two years just on the donations of family and friends and um, live an itinerant lifestyle in Europe and try to keep my vision and goal in sight. So eventually in 2013, I, 2012, actually, I got over to Perth. And even from there, it wasn't straightforward. It took another two years before I got a place at Damasara Nuns Monastery and got to take the Bhikkhuni ordination. So by now I'd been ordained for eight years. Yeah. And so one of the problems with not having bikini ordination is you lose that level of seniority. And that is not a personal issue. I mean, I never wanted to be put forward to, <laughs> into a leadership role, but what you're doing is losing a lot of the experience and wisdom of women who are actually not new to monastic life, but then have to start almost from scratch. And so I've been ordained now for 15 years, but seven years as a bikuni, and so it does have an impact on how far you're able to share the dhamma and and um, guide the community so but once i've been ordained for 12 years i'll be able to ordain other bikunis so i think that will be quite a wonderful thing um and so yeah the the dilemma that i am in now is is trying to start a monastery for women in a country where the leading Sangha in this country, the most respected monks and nuns in the Theravada tradition, um, have not um, supported bhikkhuni ordination for one reason or another, because they don't feel able to, or because of their understanding of loyalty to the lineage. I'm not quite sure why. Sometimes people feel it can be about support. They need the support from the Thai people. So there's a kind of financial aspect to that. Um, whatever the reason, it means I'm extremely isolated and I haven't seen another monastic now for since February 2020. I haven't seen another monastic. So that is challenging because when you ordain, you ordain into the Sangha and the Sangha, the family of monastics becomes your family, basically. Um, but luckily Ajahn Brahm is a massive support to me and I connect with him every week and other bhikkhunis who are distributed around the world, often a lot of them also quite isolated and alone. And so, yes, this is challenging, but it also makes us very strong. I think we have to be, you have to have a very, very strong resolve, um, you know, an aspiration to live the holy life to its, to its end because otherwise, and many women do give up. So there's some of the challenges that I face. 
Thank, Thank you. you, Vinder Chandra. It does sound like, you know, there's been quite a lot for you to overcome and still to overcome. So, you know, it's fantastic that you could share some of that with us. We do have quite a few questions coming in now. Uh, does Ajahn Brahm want to say something on this question or are we going to move to another question? Mm -hmm. Move to a new question. Okay. So Ruth could read out something, some question if you like. So a couple of people have asked a similar question, which is, is there an age limitation for ordaining? No, there's no age limit for ordaining in the Vinaya. Uh, even there was one man apparently was ordained at 120. <laughs> it's a bit unbelievable, but he was ordained at 120, became enlightened a few months later and died a few months later. I was leaving it to the last minute, so it's not recommended. However, in some monasteries, especially just monasteries with only a small number of uh, uh, nuns or monks, it is a very old person ordains. We have to look after them and care for them. And if it's uh, someone who is very sickly, it takes a lot to look after somebody, which means the other nuns are just burdened by looking after an elderly nun. In a big monastery like the monastery where I live, where we can take on elderly people because you've got lots of young uh, men ordaining there. And even in our Dhammasara Bhikkhuni Monastery in Perth, there's one nun there that uh, she ordained, oh, it was about in the late 60s or something. She's very old, and but she's amazingly healthy and a great inspiration for everybody. So there's no actual rule. There's just the community makes their own local rules uh, in order to preserve enough time for them to meditate. So there's no real rule at all about the age for ordination. It's just what's practical and what's not practical. Okay. It's best to do it early if you really want to. <laughs> it makes life much easier. Thank you. So following on from that, I'm kind of grouping questions together. And if anyone who's put a question in the chat wants to unmute themselves to ask their question, that's absolutely fine. But I might just kind of group some of these questions together. Um, what do you both feel about the eight special rules for bikinis? This is a question from Angela. Well, can I say that first of all? That if you actually look at the Vinaya, there is some sort of problems with saying that those were established by the Buddha himself. And so just some, uh, some, some logical, rational reasons why to say, was that really the form of those original rules in the time of the Buddha? And also we have the idea of uh, the rules of Vinaya are there for certain purposes. And those purposes are supposed to be, according to how the Buddha said, to establish no confidence, faith in this part to those without any faith at all, and to increase the faith of those who have uh, already gained some confidence in the Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha. And little by little, some of those old rules, which are there even for monks in the Vinaya, you look at them, for example, one of the sacred rules, I'm not allowed to stand up and give a talk to people who are sitting down. It's supposed to be disrespectful. But the meaning for that is when a person is listening to you, when you're giving a talk in an auditorium at a conference or a lecture theater, you want to make sure that people are respectful. That's all. So standing up, sitting down, what you are doing, what other people are doing, that's not as important as what the rule was really there for. And so the rules for bhikkhunis, those scarodamas, what were they really there for? And it is you know, to have respect for one another and to inspire people. And if some of those uh, Garudamas, if they were kept literally to what you think it was said, then sometimes it would destroy people's faith and make even like living as a bhikkhuni impossible. And so when I actually, the Garudamas, one of those things which they do is the bhikkhunis over in Dhammasara, Every fortnight, they give a call to take what they call the awada. And I ask them, are you keeping those eight rules in a way an intelligent, respectful bhikkhuni would do in our modern world? And they say, yes, they do. And they do that. Not maybe in the form which monks 
would think is appropriate, but the forms which our lay community think is very appropriate. And that's what's most important. I know that sometimes that monks who disagree with the establishment of bhikkhunis, sometimes they find fault with bhikkhunis for not keeping this rule of Vinaya or that rule of Vinaya. But I've never yet, even in Thailand or in Wat Papong, see monks who keep the rules of Vinaya. <laughs> they keep most of them, and it's inspiring what they do keep. There's always, if you really want to find fault, it's very easy to find fault with things which they do, which they shouldn't be doing. And this is one of the reasons why it's so easy to criticize others, but you should always look to see how you're practicing yourself. And I think all of you who have seen someone like uh, uh, Bhikkhuni Chanda, is she a good Bhikkhuni? Is she practicing beautifully, teaching and uh, restrained? And I think everyone who knows her would say yes. She is keeping those rules to a very high standard. It may not be perfect, but I don't know any monk or nun in the world who keeps them perfectly, according to the book, but according to their kindness, their wisdom, and their understanding of what those rules are there for. That's how I understand the Garodamas. Thank you. I wonder if Sriani wanted well to ask a question. She's unmuted herself. Yeah. Um, thank you, Bhante. I want to know this. There is um, uh, 227 Vinaya uh, rules for monks, and for the bhikkhunis, there is 84 more. Right? Do you think it's fair to have those 84 extra? <laughs> it depends which way you look at it. Because sometimes we say, oh, for Sila Dara, they only have 10 rules. And for, for fully ordained monks, they have 227. We have more rules. Does that mean that, that uh, it's uh, an imposition for monks and for bhikkhunis to have 311 rules? Is that an imposition for them? No, you'll find that when a person doesn't just study those rules, but practices them, they're just so easy to practice. It's all about simplicity, having few possessions, renouncing, being harmless, being kind. And you know, these days when people ask for precepts, you now even lay people ask for precepts, sometimes they ask for the five precepts. And when I tell them, well, it's a bit difficult. I will say just two precepts. Can you keep two precepts? And this comes from the Buddha's own advice to his son, Rahura. The two precepts are don't ever do anything which harms another living being. Number two, don't do anything which harms yourself. So those rules and precepts become quite easy to understand and beautiful to understand. And they're very easy to keep. I've been a monk now for almost 48 years. And I don't worry about those rules because they're so easy to keep. Now, why would I want money? Why would I want to have possessions? Why would I want to eat in the evening? Those of you who see me, I'm already fat enough. <laughs> you don't need to, to increase my girth. So little by little, the rules become just easy rules of kindness, simplicity, and peace, generosity, all those wonderful things. So for me, usually the more precepts you have, the more senior you are in Buddhism. So because bhikkhunis have more precepts than monks, Maybe Bhikkhuni should sit at the head of the line because they've got more precepts than I have. They've got 311, 84 more, so they're obviously senior, aren't they? Exactly. <laughs> I thought you'd say that. I had thought of that because, yeah, as you say, many monks say, well, we're more senior because, you know, Sila Dara's actually observe 150 precepts. They're based on the Bhikkhuni Vinaya, so they do have quite a few more, but they can't technically class themselves as bhikkhunis because they don't have the ordination. So technically they're novices, but they actually observe 150. And in that community, the monks uh, consider themselves senior because they have more rules. So by the same logic, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the point is yeah. also with the Vinaya, if I could just add to that, I don't see them as rules because the whole of the Dhamma is a living, breathing system. It's something to be applied with compassion and wisdom. I think of them more as training guidelines or trainings. 
And never in there does it say one should not do this, one should not do that. What it actually says is eating in the evening is an offence to be confessed. So what it's actually saying is that these are the things that you can use to help you increase mindfulness and to acknowledge, you know, to a senior person um, the way you're living, especially if you feel that you're in breach of any of the restraint straining rules. So it's this beautiful system of mutual admonishment and also mutual respect. And it's something that's living and breathing. It's not fixed in time. It has to be applied. Otherwise, where is the real scope for developing the mind through the Vinaya practice? You know, it's very easy to just take something literally and become dogmatic and start judging others, but it's much harder to actually develop an inner ethic that is able to respond to particular contexts and situations. And that's where I feel the Vinaya can be a very rich source of refining one's virtue. Thank you. Thank you both. So we have some more questions, unless there's anyone else you wanted to ask the question. So Ruth will read another one out. So Venerable Chanda, I might group a few questions together because they concern the Anakampa mission. So um, there's a question asking how the mission is developing for Anakampa in practical terms um, and has COVID stalled things. Um, also someone asked where the Bikini Monastery is that would be an interesting question because I know that's um, something that you're looking to, to build. And uh, maybe we'll do those two together and then I'll give you a few more, if that's okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah, it's so interesting. As I say, challenges are often just learning curves because I think the way we imagined this monastery and the project to go was to start off with a little place in Oxford and have guests coming to visit and from those guests developing a kind of mini monastery. Um, and then some of those guests perhaps coming with me to move to a bigger place. But because of COVID, that hasn't happened in the last year and a bit. Um, and so at first I thought, oh gosh, this is really strange. We've got this lovely place and I've got all these empty rooms, only three rooms, but still enough to have guests, you know, and we did have a regular flow of guests before COVID. And it felt a bit sad that suddenly it's empty and I'm on my own. But then I realized, okay, I could go on retreat and just, you know, disappear and take the opportunity to meditate. But what I felt much more moved to do was find a way to serve the community. And so just with the intention to offer support and offer um, teachings and a, a place of spiritual refuge and friendship, we started the online Zumi Bikuni sessions, teaching okay. every week. We have Dhamma talks, meditations, meta meditation, and also a chanting session every Wednesday, where we dedicate uh, thoughts of loving kindness and compassion to anyone who we feel could do with a bit of extra support. And we've just started to have Friday evening sutta discussion groups as well, which are really popular. We have 50 people coming every week. Um, and we're going into some depth, you know, into the Buddha's teaching. So what's actually happened is that we've developed a wider community and a, a really committed, steady group of people who turn up to everything I do. Many of you are here today. I always say it's the usual suspects. <laughs> some of you are in America, some in England, some I don't know where else. A lot of you from all over Europe. And, uh, and so I feel... In a way, it's shown what the real benefit of having a bhikkhuni sangha can be. You know, as I said, when things get tough, where do you go for support? And many people have realized that the Dhamma is the only real place to go. The only place that can really bring you a sense of peace, even contentment, even in the middle of a storm. So it's developing differently than we might have expected, but I'll be really interested once restrictions start to lift to see how that translates into support on the ground, whether you know people come forward and say, actually, you know, my practice has started to take off and I'm really considering spending some time in a monastery, or I'm even considering, you know, coming along and being a caretaker, or even becoming the first Anagarika who trains with me. So it'll be very interesting to see how that turns out. As to the question about where the monastery is, that really is still dependent on many causes and conditions coming together. So I want to emphasize that we don't yet have 
what we could really class as a forest monastery. We have a little rented place in Oxford and I have to move out of here in June because um, the owner's selling the house. So I'm going to spend my rains retreat in a very small cottage in rural England, um, just hidden away for, for some quiet and some solitude. And then after that, we're planning to try and rent somewhere in the area of Stroud, because I think that could offer a good balance between pretty rural countryside and a feeling of you know peace and calm whilst being fairly well connected to London, to Oxford, to places where I have a lot of volunteers and, um, and friends now who support the project. So we really want to encourage people's support in this. We're still looking at three different aspects. We need to raise more funds, quite a lot more funds, several hundred thousand more really, in order to get something of a reasonable size with some land for cooties. And we need to have people committed to come and live with me as part of a community, maybe who want to ordain in the long run. And thirdly, we need to have a local community too in that area. And we already know six or seven people in that area. So it will be good to go and check it out. But yeah, many things have to come together. I still do far too much admin work. Yesterday was a day off. So I felt like I didn't have a schedule, I didn't have video calls, but I found that I was still basically doing emails and, and phone calls from about nine in the morning till seven at night. That was a light day, that was a, a sort of day off. So I need to be freed up so that I can bring forth yeah, Dhamma from a fresh, energized body and mind. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um... Jitta Shuba, I don't know if I'm saying your name right, would you like to read your question out or would you like me to read it for you? I read it, okay. So, um, the question is, would you please comment on MN115 that says it's impossible for a woman to be accomplished one, a fully enlightened one. What do you tell women who encounter this teaching and find it very unsettling to think that this is the Buddha's teaching? Could I answer that? Please. Because I, I, I went to the Bhikkhuni Samyutta this morning. Ta da! <laughs> Samyutta Nikaya, very wonderful. What, actually, probably my favorite of all the books in the Pali Canon. And um, there's one chapter all about Bhikkhunis. And so there were very many enlightened Bhikkhunis in the Buddha's day. Firstly, I should introduce Venerable Patachara, who is sitting here. And some of you may have noticed this is a very unusual and rather beautiful statue carved from hibiscus wood in Bali. And this is not just a female Buddha, this is a real enlightened bhikkhuni from the Buddha's day called Venerable Patachara. And she was foremost in the Vinaya, in the discipline, and also a really great teacher. She had about 500 fully enlightened disciples who became enlightened only after coming in contact with her and her teachings. And she also went through great difficulties. So there were very many um, enlightened bhikkhunis in the Buddha's day, uh, whose legacy has been preserved in the texts. And, you know, they have verses in the Terigata proclaiming their enlightenment, telling their stories of how they were enlightened and the obstacles they overcame. And also this lovely chapter in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta, which I want to just read one of the verses out for you here. So perhaps I'll read the whole thing. It's not very long. So this is called Soma at Savati. Then in the morning, the bhikkhuni Soma dressed and taking bowl and robe entered Savati for arms. When she'd walked for arms in Savati and had returned from her arms round, after her meal, she went to the blind men's grove for the day's abiding. Having plunged into the blind men's grove, she sat down at the foot of a tree for the day's abiding. Then Mara, the evil one, desiring to arouse fear, trepidation and terror in the Bhikkhuni Soma, desiring to make her fall away from Samadhi and stillness, approached her and addressed her in verse. So this is the evil one saying these words. That state so hard to achieve, which is to be attained by seers, cannot be attained by a woman with her two-fingered wisdom. Then it occurred to the Bhikkhuni Soma. Now, who is this that recited the verse, a human being or a non-human being? 
Then it occurred to her, this is Mara, the evil one, who has recited the verse, desiring to arouse fear, trepidation and terror in me, desiring to make me fall away from Samadhi. Then the Bhikkhuni Soma, having understood this is Mara, the evil one, replied to him in verses. What does womanhood matter at all when the mind is stilled, when the mind is in deep Samadhi, when knowledge flows on steadily? as one sees correctly into Dhamma. One to whom it might occur, I am a woman, or I am a man, or I am anything at all, is fit for Mara to address. Then Mara, the evil one, realizing that Bhikkhuni Soma knows me, sad and disappointed, disappeared <laughs> right there. <laughs> So this is very lovely, isn't it? And it's not that womanhood matters as in it's a, you know, some kind of like lower rebirth. It's just that gender is actually irrelevant, totally irrelevant because the mind is the mind that sees the Dhamma. It's wisdom that gets us enlightened and wisdom can arise wherever there's an absence of delusion. So it's Mara who says such things. It's not the Buddha. There are many great bhikkhuni disciples in the Buddha's day and there will be many today as well. There are already some, <laughs> but just less because we don't have a bigger, as big a sample pool. I don't know if Ajahn wants to add anything. Well, that is fine. It's wonderful. It's wonderful that answer comes from a woman, not a man. So one thing which I would add, though, that that quote was concerning like a fully enlightened Buddha why most fully enlightened Buddhas men, we think. And of course, we only know the last one, and maybe the one before Venukasapa. But then when you look, if a person was going to be reborn and become a Buddha, where would they get reborn? And what gender would they be in order to make their teachings readily available, given the biggest possible, um, if you like, publicity? biggest possible breadth. And in the time of India, 2,500 years ago, it was much easier to teach as a man. And that would be why the person who we know as Buddha Gautama was reborn as a, a male. But times have changed. And if a person you know, was needed a Buddha in our current age, where would they get reborn? What gender would they be? And sometimes you may think, that maybe they could be reborn in Europe or United States or something, and even be reborn as a female, even be reborn as a black African female. How powerful would that be to make a great statement that you know, Buddhas don't have to be Asian, they don't have to be white, they can be all sorts of colors, whatever is the statement the current Buddha wants to make to spread his teachings wider and further. And I look at all the people who are on this talk today. There's no, any, is, is there any black Africans here? Or are we all Caucasian women? Caucasian men? We've got a few uh, Asians, which are wonderful, Indians. But where are the Afros? So Amina's here. Amina's here. Oh, she is great. I haven't seen her. But anyway, that there's so few. <laughs> so that must be the next monastery we built. Yeah, there is a, a monastery being built by um, Venerable um, Buddha Rekita in Uganda. Which oh, is oh yeah, she's. Yeah. Oh, that's man. But it's also it's a, a it's a monk's monastery. But his mother's yeah. there too. His mother's ordained yeah. there as well. It's also got that. Uh, African American bikuni over yeah. in, in Sacramento. Okay, Venerable Panyavati. That's right, yes, yeah. She's amazing. Yeah. She's amazing. Yeah. The Dhamma's for all. all Indeed, happen. yes. But <laughs> to be a Buddha, I mean, if you were going to be a Buddha, what would you choose to make the best statement to reach as many people as possible and to inspire people? Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you. So I've got a couple of um, technical questions as they were. I think they're from Shiriani. 
Um, first of all, what is a temporary ordination? And second of all, what is a Siladara or who is a Siladara? That's quick and easy. So temporary ordination is you take an ordination for a short period of time. And a Siladara are the um, nuns communities in uh, Amaravati and Chithurst Buddhist monasteries. And they only um, exist in those two monasteries. It's not, um, it's an ordination platform that was basically um, created so that women could essentially follow the bhikkhuni training without actually having the bhikkhuni ordination. So it's sort of higher than novice ordination, but it's not a recognized platform um, beyond those monasteries. And this is one of the difficulties and one of the reasons bhikkhuni ordination is important because if you're a siladara non, that ordination is not really recognized anywhere else. So you don't fit in with novices, you don't fit in with bhikkhunis, you can't join in the patimoka, in the recitation of the rules. Whereas if you're a bhikkhuni, you have a standardized ordination procedure and platform, which enables you to be part of a global community. So I can go to any bhikkhuni monastery, whether it's in California or in India or in um, Africa, if there was, <laughs> in Perth, of course, and also in Taiwan, in Korea, in Mahayana countries, because the platform is basically coming from the Dhamma Guptaka tradition. It's the same Vinaya um, root, the same roots. Um, so that creates a much more global international um, community and uh, vehicle that we can all meet on common ground. Thank you. Okay, so a question from Marie. Marie, if you're here and you want to unmute yourself and you'd like to ask your question, please do so now. Otherwise, I'm happy to read it out for you. Okay, so Marie asks, in Buddhism after patriarchy, author Rita M. Gross posits that part of the historical bhikkhuni lineage falling off was less economic support from the lay community which is something you briefly touched on, Venerable Chanda, she mentions. Are you seeing equal community support and donations from contemporary bhikkhuni monasteries, or is economic support still trending in equal? Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, some exceptions are there. For example, I'm sure that Ajahn Brahm would want to say that in Perth, the bhikkhuni monastery is very well supported, but that is under the umbrella of the BSWA and the monks came first. And so due to Ajahn Brahm's wonderful way of educating and embodying the Dhamma, um, the communities in Perth have accepted bhikkhunis and have understood their importance because once you have bhikkhunis, you realize they're worthy of support. So they are well supported through the BSWA, which is supporting monks and nuns. But in my experience in most parts of the world, for example, in California, we mentioned Ayatata Loka earlier from uh, Damadarini Monastery, and she is the senior most Western bhikkhuni, um, Theravada bhikkhuni, with I think at least 30 years, and please forgive me Aya if I'm incorrect here, and it's more than that. Um, she's very senior as a bhikkhuni, and I know that her monastery um, is supported, is well supported, but it's certainly not lavishly supported. Um, they have maybe three or four nuns, and the same for most of the other bhikkhuni monasteries in California. They have some have two, some have three, some have four, um, and they just about manage. But the thing is, because there are so few of us, we're all sort of, we step up into leadership roles very soon in our monastic lives. And in order to raise, in order to generate enough support and have enough of a public presence, we have to be pretty together. We don't have a lot of time to sort of learn the ropes before we have to go out there and teach. And so most of these nuns have actually um, managed to survive because they're very gifted teachers or because they've had to really work hard to learn to teach at quite a young age in their monastic life. Um, so it's a lot of hard work for nuns. We don't have the same opportunities to just sit quietly at the back <laughs> and have a very peaceful life as a junior monastic. I mean, I'm sure there are many monks in Ajahn Brahm's monastery who have had like 20 years in robes and they're not regularly teaching, you know, they're, they're getting on with a very quiet life. And this is why support's important because some of us may want to teach, but some of us may not. We may want to study the suttas for 20 years and become Pali scholars. We may want to, you know, just be like live more like hermits. 
Um, but at the moment, because the Bikini Sangha is not that well supported, we're all sort of pushed out into the public in a way and into leadership roles quite early on. So yeah, it, it's definitely more of a, a struggle to, to manage and certainly donations and food offerings are much more forthcoming in monks monasteries. I'm sure at Amravati they get tens if not hundreds of people every day. I get maybe one or two cooked meals a week, partly because of COVID, but even before then I would have one guest and they would have to cook for me every single day. So that's the difference. Thank you. Um, question from Mana. Again, I will read it out unless Mana, you want to unmute yourself. And I'm going to kind of group it together with another question further down the chat. Um, so the question is How would an aspiring Anagarika um, join the Anukampa Bakuni project in future and be trained towards full Bakuni ordination? And someone else asks How can we access your teachings at the moment? So I'm going to. Okay. Well, accessing my teachings is super easy. Um, if you sign up to our newsletter on anukampaproject.org, you'll find a newsletter sign up and all the links are in there. Otherwise, you just go to our events page, anukampaproject.org slash events, and that will take you to the same newsletter with all the links. So there are teachings on Wednesdays, Fridays, every other Saturday, every other Sunday, and also some day retreats. So that's really easy. Um, thank you for asking about your about an aspiring Anagarika, because this is what we're really doing this for, to make you know possibilities to ordain and commit to the Dhamma for life in the monastic form available. So um, it's a tricky project in the sense that I'm the only bhikkhuni so far. So anyone coming in would probably be best already having a fairly decent practice, fairly regular practice, and also um, being able to balance that with service. So there will be service involved because you'll be part of creating something, which is also quite exciting, right? And you have a chance to work closely with me. But the basic way that it happens is, um, like if, if we were having guests right now, you would apply to come and stay, and the first visit would be seven days, and then you'd go away and, you know, review how that was, whether that was beneficial for you, ben beneficial for your practice, and then come for longer stays bit by bit. Um, and then when we get to know you and you get to know us, if you feel that, yeah, this could be, you know, a spiritual community where I could imagine myself growing, then you could ask for the um, anagorica training. And um, on anagorica training, you take eight precepts. So you would still be handling money and driving and cooking, shopping for food. So at that point, you probably still need to have some of your own personal funds, but you would be part of the community. And after a year, when you, um, a year of staying and practicing as an Anagarika, then you have the opportunity to ask for the novice ordination. And that is when you actually take the robes. So this is the real renunciation you know, of course, there's a higher ordination, but the hallmark for me of ordination is when we renounce the use of money, because at that point, you really are letting go of a lot, you know, a lot of control over your life, a lot of preferences and wants, you know, you're basically an arms mendicant at that point. Um, and then see how that goes. And after a couple of years as a novice, then you could ask for the bikini ordination. And it would be very special because the first bikini ordination in England will involve other bikinis traveling over from overseas or perhaps you and I would go together to Perth and we'd take the ordination for you there so it's always a big deal when somebody ordains as a bikini and a great cause for celebration so that is roughly how it would go but it's definitely a journey it's uh, as I've mentioned you know there's lots of uh, challenges along the way but I'm hoping that through this project we'll make some of those paths a little bit smoother and more direct Thank you. So um, thanks to Mel and Kelly who put the link to the Anacampa project in the chat. So if you do want to click on that, it will take you straight there. Um, so uh, this is another question from Marie and I think it kind of ties into what you were just talking about. So I'm gonna go with this one. Um, the Anacampa website, it says it must, you must be debt free to ordain. Are there any programs to help aspirants discharge student loans? Um, 
what do you recommend? <laughs> I thought I had to ask because... Uh, can I say something there? Uh, if the student loan only needs to be repaid when you start earning, then it's not a loan which needs to be repaid. There are some of the young men, uh, they do have student loans, but the rule is that only when you can afford to repay it, do you have to repay it. Which does mean that you know, if you become a bhikkhuni, you don't need to repay it at all. It's not regarded as a debt. Simple. Good. Um, Julia has a question, which again ties into what we're talking about. What would be a reason to not ordain? And what should you be really sure about if you're considering ordination? Do you want to speak, Ajahn, or shall I? No, you do. You're doing such a good job. <laughs> um, the reason not to ordain is if you have no aspiration to ordain and you feel that you're practicing and developing very well in your lay life. Um, even then, it's not a real reason not to, because sometimes we can try different things. Um, <laughs> not to ordain, I guess, if you're doing it for status, that's not going to work, especially being a bikuni is going to be very hard work. <laughs> but I don't think there are many reasons not to ordain. And if you ask a nun about that, they're bound to say that, right? <laughs> because it just gives you so many benefits, such a sense of commitment, dedication to the path. You know, such a sense of freedom, having made that decision and, and having that as the center of your life, you know, that liberation is the meaning of your life, whether it happens in this lifetime or another lifetime. This is like your everything that drives you, you know, everything that you live for. Um, so I can't really think of reasons not to. Uh, what was the other part of the question? Oh, what shall you be really sure about if you consider ordination? Again, it's a journey, so you don't have to be really sure in the beginning. You just come and stay in a monastery and see how it goes. Um, I would say for bhikkhunis and for you know um, joining new communities that it's really worth visiting different places because you are not necessarily going to resonate with the way one particular community does things, or maybe you will have strong personal connections with a particular nun and not with another. So that sense of spiritual friendship is really important. Um, and I think it's worth taking your time to find out which place suits you first. But later on, as we have more monasteries, it won't be the most important consideration because you'll be able to hopefully move around as bhikkhus do. They have a lot of monasteries, so they might train in one and stay with the teacher for the first five years. But after that, they'll be able to go and spend time in other places and learn different things from different communities, different teachers. So that would be really wonderful and a very rich way to live monastic life. Um, so I don't know about being really sure. I suppose for me, it was such a strong calling that I was always really sure. And that does help, especially when you have to um, face challenges. But, you know, there's no punishment if you try something and then you decide it's not for you. There's no sort of stigma involved with disrobing. So I would say it's great to give it a chance. Let the aspiration develop over time. And when you feel ready, you'll know. You know, and then if you're fortunate enough, conditions will come together and you take it from there. So be open to a journey. Thank you. Um, Diana asked a question for Ajahn Brahm. And Diana, again, I'm happy to read it unless you want to unmute yourself. Um, Ajahn Brahm, did you know before you performed the first bikuni ordination what the personal consequences to you would be? Thank you for questioning authority, listening to your heart and reviving this bad <laughs> tradition from the Buddha's day. Yes, you no. Know, sometimes people thought I lost a lot. When you add everything up, you gained much more than you lost. Uh, you felt uh, peaceful and happy about yourself. I don't know if anybody knows uh, the novel Lord Jim. Uh, I forget who was the author now. But there was a point in that novel, a critical moment, where he could stay on the boat to do his duty and save the passengers there, or jump uh, into the, the one lifeboat and save his life. And just in a moment, he decided to jump and save his life. And he regretted that for the rest of his days. And that was similar. And the, the crucial moments you know, in Wat Pa Pong, this whole sangha, there's about 400 of the monks there, and they're all asking for my blood, basically. And you had a choice. 
you know, can I deny the validity of those four women who'd become bhikkhunis? If I did that, then I would be re, um, reinstated and welcomed back into that fold of Wat Bapong. Or if I stood my ground and said, no, that they are bhikkhunis, then I would be thrown out. One of those moments you have in your life, you decided to stand your ground because that's what you know was right. You knew what was true. And the personal consequences didn't matter at all. And you know, I didn't care what the personal consequences were. But I knew that those were four women who deserved to be bhikkhunis. They were bhikkhunis. And I'd take anything which was thrown at me. But of course, that all disappeared after a short while. And the, the benefits you get after, out of that far outweigh just any negative consequences. And the fact I obviously do get inspired, you know, when I see bhikkhuni monasteries growing, when you see Ayachanda working, like I said, already a butt of uh, teaching, getting this thing going, and let's see all the other wonderful things which are happening for Buddhism in the West, when there's fairness, that anyone who wants to be a monk or a nun, who can be a monk or a nun, have the opportunities open for them. To be part of that, I know the teachings of the Buddha, that you notice what the Buddha would say, that you're helping in a small way, re-establishing the bhikkhuni sangha. Now in the West, that's huge, enormous good karma. And you feel the results every day. You know what it's like in your life, at the end of your life, you think, what have I done? What really wonderful things have I done to make a better world? And that's one of the beautiful things you can do to help establish this bhikkhuni sangha. Now in UK, in Europe, it, it, it's such a small thing at the moment. One nun. You know, how many bhikkhunis are there in UK? I'm the only English bhikkhuni. <laughs> Exactly. In the UK. I know there's one more English bhikkhuni in California. No, in yes. Canada, I think. And yeah. that's it. That's it. There's a yeah, Welsh one as well. That's, yeah, that's, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. that's in the Theravada tradition. Yeah. So no, now we can have sort of the bhikkhunis, many of them. And when you work to make that happen, oh, that's so inspiring. And you just, just by thinking about that, you get a huge amount of good karma and you get so much happiness and strength and power. That's one of what we've done so far, but the opportunity is there to bring it to fruition. Mm. So please, I ask all of you to help in whatever way you can. Thank you. Um, Mel, I'm sorry, I missed your question. Uh, and I will, it's another one for Ajahn Brahm. Um, again, Mel, please, please feel free to unmute yourself and jump in, but I will read it out. Um, Mel says, it was wonderful to hear you talk, Ajahn, so passionately about equality in Buddhism. Is there now equality in regards to hierarchy within the Bodhiana, not just in regards to the lunch queue, but in terms of decision-making as well? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there will always be that uh, equality in decision-making, because that's how it was set out by the Buddha. You know, that I get outvoted many times. I've been a monk for such a long time. But somebody just decides, oh no, they, they feel there's a better way of doing things. So the patriarchy isn't that the head monk is always right. So I do get outvoted. And that, that's, that's how it should be. Remember when the Buddha passed away, and he said that once he had passed away, that there won't be one monk or none be the leader from now on. The Dhammavinya would be the leader. That would be your chief. That's what you should follow, not a, not a person. And so part of our rules is like it's a democracy. It's a democracy which is devolved to every monastery. It's independent. And they make their own rules within the Vinaya. But the way they do things, the time they eat, how much they work, you know, it has to be in the morning time. We have so much freedom to do it which way we want. And that makes it sort of very alive. Now, it's even like a little thing. You, know, you see that as Theravada monks, because we're trained in Thailand, we shave our eyebrows off. But one, of my <coughs> one of my disciples who lives uh, in the branch monastery, that he keeps his eyebrows on. 
That's his decision. And there's nothing I can do. Actually, nothing I really want to do to stop that. <laughs> it's a small thing. But nevertheless, it shows that there is that independence. That each little monastery has their own way of doing things. And what uh, Ayachanda said, that means that some monasteries are very strong on one area, maybe weak in other areas. And other monasteries are you know, strong in somewhere else. Which means each one of a person who wants to stay in a monastery, what should be happening is they can find the one which they really like, where they have a connection with the teacher, where they like the routine, where they just appreciate the situation. So you have choice. And when you're there, you fit in with the community. And it's a community you decide you know, how many evening talks to have, how much to go out, how much to stay inside, how much solitude, how much service. That's the way it was at the time of the Buddha. I mean, it's the best for everybody. I always remember when you were saying that some monks or nuns don't like to teach. And one of the amazing monks was Anuruddha. And, you know, reading his life story, he just couldn't teach. Fully enlightened. Amazing, with so many powers. But, you know, he couldn't give a Dhamma son. So that was fine. He was so inspiring in so many different areas. It's wonderful we can accept that. The variety of human beings and those who want to, to become a monastic can renounce. They're not judged because what they can do, what they can't do. They just serve in whichever way they can. And that's the inspirational model, which is there in the Vinaya, which is there where inside a monastery, there's not a patriarchy or a matriarchy and within the monastery. It's outside, you see patriarchies. And they're just, they're obnoxious to me. And one of the, one bhikkhuni conference, which I went to, I forget who said this, but it really inspired me. And they said, well, you know, we're bhikkhunis. So why do we need men's permission to validate us? We are bhikkhunis, whether they like it or not, we're big coonies. <laughs> Learn to live with it. And I thought that's a beautiful way of speaking. Could I add one thing to that, if there's time? Please, yes. Thank you. Because I think um, in that question, <coughs> I think Mel might be referring to equality of decision making between monks and nuns at the monastery. And I just wanted to point out, if that's right or not, um, that the communities are actually separate. So the monks monastery is Bodhinyana and the nuns monastery is Dhammasara. And that is also for that reason, so that um, women can make their own decisions in their own nuns monasteries, in their own bhikkhuni monasteries. Um, and the monks don't have a say in those decisions. So each monastery, as Ajahn Brahm said, is independent. Um, and so one of the advantages I think of a nuns community usually not always and again it depends on the individual but i think women tend to be quite um democratic and we don't tend to have such rigid hi hierarchies we do tend to have a more sort of equal friendly kind of um system but actually the buddha never did lay it out as a very uh, strict hierarchy that's again quite a cultural thing and i've seen that in bodhinyana uh, monks monastery it's very democratic. It's really inspirational to see how everyone is treated with utmost respect. Thanks. But it's just a point about how, it, you know, part of being ordained as bhikkhunis is to give us autonomy in terms of leading our own communities as well. So not only taking the ordinations, but developing our own communities the way that suit us. Thank you. Just being mindful of time, I think I might see if Jeff would like to ask any questions or... Um, I, well, actually, I feel inundated with questions and remarks because what we're doing here, I think, is so important. It's really, if I could use this word, quite revolutionary. And I think we might see that when, you know, if we're still here in a few decades' time, we will see how important it is, but we're not, perhaps not quite seeing how important it is. And most of, most of my questions would come from the vantage point of someone who is a lay, a serious lay, lay person. 
um, who has put a lot into uh, disseminating the, the Dharma over, over the two decades or more. So it's been a really important part of my life. But from that vantage point, it sometimes can feel quite lonely as to what is it that I'm supposed to be doing? How as a lay leader, or amongst other leaders, am I, am I, what, what, what can I do? You know, we talked a lot about doing rather than talking about it. Um, but sometimes we do need to talk about it. And that is, from your point of view, what is it should be important in my point of view? And that is, what are the things that I should emphasize to overcome all sorts of problems, mainly cultural problems, is that we can't ignore the fact that we live in a society with a culture already. <laughs> it's got a Christian background. My, my wife is a Christian priest. Um, in the Anglican Church. My wife, incidentally, is also black. Uh, we both know how to deal with divisiveness, and we've had the courage to sometimes jump into the deep end. But I think I'm getting to an age where I would like to hear from those that we think we are helping, we would like to hear from them as to what they count as, as, as help. What, can, what should we be doing? I mean, for example, just a trivial example. Stroud, very nice. London, a mega city. Where should we actually be? In the nice countryside with the birds singing? Or should we be where there are millions of people with all sorts of human problems, uh, misunderstandings and misery? Should we perhaps be there? I could get to London in 30 minutes. Stroud looks like more like two hours. But I, I'm not trying to make a special case for myself now. I'm just saying that there are lots and lots and lots of questions about what lay people should be doing to support the monastic life in the situation that we've actually got. We can't close our, I, for example, there are a lot of people that are using Buddhism at the moment for all sorts of <laughs> irrelevance. Um, and rather self-interested reasons. So it becomes very fashionable. It gets twisted into uh, ways of speaking, such as the therapies, for example, which sometimes jar the nerves a little bit. They're not quite what we, we, we're, we're up to in Buddhism. I mean, from, from our point of view, what should we be doing about that? Because, you know, we're in a different, we're in a different position, but we are with you. We are with you, but we want to hear from you. What is it we should be doing? So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Sorry if that was starting to turn into a bit of a rant, but, <laughs> but I think good. you can see how important it is uh, to me and those uh, in New Buddha Way. I'll stop there, uh, but uh, did you want to? I was also asked if I would thank you. Thank you all. Should, should we do that? Or do you want to re reply to what I said? Perhaps? I don't know. Let Ajahn reply. It's a very <laughs> okay. good question. What can well, they do, already, Ajahn? Well, you don't need to have big goals. Just a small goal, which you've done today, to invite uh, both monastics to talk about the problems which uh, of establishing equity in Buddhism. The very fact that you've organized this is a wonderful step. So organize more of these things. Get to know one another more. COVID is, seems to be... Uh, lessening in its intensity, so go and visit Ayachanda. Ayachanda, you go and give more talks or, and get that contact between people and also get like knowledge as well. So any sort of monk, Theravada monk who says, there are no such things as bhikkhunis, they go, oh, bhikkhunis. So that's established. They say, well, 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 they're just not really part of our tradition. They are part of the tradition. They're part of the human tradition. Not just so much Thai forest tradition. The UK is not Thailand. And that tradition is ours. So support our tradition of humanity. People who want to, you know, to, to move in a way of like Theravada Buddhism, male or female. And it's always a work in progress. So what you've done today is a marvelous uh, thing to do. More of those things can be done. And little by little, we grow that support you know, for a good 
uh, Theravada monastery as it was in the time of the Buddha. You say Theravada, you know that there's not that much difference between Theravada and some Mahayana groups to the point that well, there's a, I used to have a really great contact with the Jogja order over in uh, South Korea. And some of those monks would spend the range retreat now uh, at Bodhinyana Monastery. And they'd join in the Pati Moka and everything. We found out their Vinaya practice was the same as ours. And we didn't really bother that they were supposed to be Mahayana, we were supposed to be Theravada. In Vietnam, they have united a Buddhist Sangha, Mahayana, Theravada. A good monk, a good nun is a good monk or a good nun. I don't know, care where they come from or what color their robes are. And those are the ones we should support. And that will be a Buddhism which goes beyond sectarianism, which goes to the practice of being a good Buddha, good Buddhist. And we focus more on that. I think we'll take Buddhism in a place like UK to a much more solid level, to inspire so many more people, and to make Buddhism real, powerful, and relevant in today's world. Too many people are dividing the world. The spiritual people, we should be uniting the world, not putting more bridges between people. Monks and nuns, that's only one bridge. We just, we're making, destroying the war between them. There's many more wars we have to bring down. And that is your job, my job, our job. So those are just some answers to that wonderful question. Thank you. Thank you. Can I add, add one thing to that? Please. Add two or three things, come on. <laughs> okay, we'll see what, how I can do. Um, I think as well as asking the monks and nuns to teach, which is wonderful, one of the really important jobs of the lay community is to support us in our practice, to support us in having solitude, having time to go deeply into our meditation because the purpose of the monastic vehicle is for people who can dedicate their entire life to the study and practice of Buddhism. And the deeper we can go in our practice, the more effective teachers we can be, the more powerful those teachings and the more we can really do to serve. So as well as you know, uh, hosting talks and um, valuing what we can give, also I think the lay community's job is to support us in that. Um, so to come to monasteries, to offer food, to stay for some time. Jeff was saying Stroud is two hours away, but that's wonderful because once you get there, you'll have to stay for a while. So you can actually <laughs> book a week <laughs> off work and you can come and stay, be part of a community, you know, or just stay overnight, cook food, offer it to the monastic community and, and you know, learn how to integrate your practice with your service. And uh, for monastics too, that's what we aim to do all the time, to integrate our meditation with the way we serve and then to take that service into our meditation practice to become a source of inspiration and a source of joy. So it's getting that balance right. So offering your services in whatever way you can, offering your practice. Yeah? Um, I think like what Ajahn Brown said, actually getting familiar with um, the bhikkhu and the bhikkhuni vinaya a little bit at least to the point where you understand that the bhikkhuni ordination is a good thing to happen. And then making it your own, you know, making sure you do keep other monastics on their toes, question them if you feel that they're not following um, gender equity or if they are discriminating, ask them questions. You know, we're supposed to be, um, uh, what's the word, open to scrutiny. Yeah? So don't have too much reverence and respect also. So they're just a few things that came to mind. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we are coming towards the end of our session. We don't have any more kind of big questions coming up unless there's somebody with us who'd like to ask their own question. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to? If you do, please unmute yourself. We've just had a look through and doesn't seem to be much happening in the chat, so. If there isn't anyone else, then I might ask Jeff to, to finish for us today by uh, saying some thank yous. Well, it's, it's a privilege to, to say thank you. I think we, we all feel so much gratitude that uh, this happening has, has happened. I don't know how, but it has happened and it's uh, really wonderful. So I want to thank the, the two speakers. Um, 
And we need to think about how we can go on helping. And there's a question I keep asking myself, so I need more conversations with Venerable Chanda and with the, uh, the uh, Ajahn. So um, certainly we want to be encouraging. We want to look into how we can boost the donations, um, give support in different ways, organize events of this sort. Um, I think I can say that we'll probably have 100% uh, support from us in New Buddha Way, or, or cl close, to New, <laughs> close to 100%. Um, the whole thing sounds so right. The words that Ajahn gave us were so full of uh, truth, you know, the truth that comes through emotion as well as uh, intellect. So we're so grateful. It's so, it's so inspiring to, to hear people that are pointing us in the right direction and are willing to take risks with their lives to, to do that. So we hope to see you all again. Uh, WESAC is coming up very soon. And I see you have some activities uh, during WESAC. So that, that will, we'll be in touch with you then about um, how, to, how to get together again. So I would just like to ask everyone here to put their hands together and just say thank you ever so much to our visitors for what we have learned from you and the time you have and effort you have put into this. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks thank you. for organizing. Bye. Take care. Bye. And thank you for, oh, you for everything. I'm from Australia. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Bhante. Thank Love you. <laughs>